So we've covered macroeconomics in more of a theoretical manner, but actually there's a story to tell here about the birth, death and rebirth of macroeconomics. But before we get started on our story, I need your help. Please like this YouTube video and if you'd like, subscribe to my channel. It really does help me. But the only way that I can continue making these videos is with your support. So if you can go to patreon.com forward slash economics understood and subscribe, that would be great. For as little as a dollar a month, you can contribute to some more great videos and influence what I make in the future. That's great. Thanks for your help. End of intermission. Let's get back to our story. I'm reminded very much of the quote John Lennon of the Beatles said in the early 60s. Before Elvis, there was nothing. If we had a macroeconomic equivalent, it would be before Keynes, there was no macroeconomics. And if you haven't heard of Keynes, you need to do a little bit of research because he is possibly the greatest economist ever, or at least one of them. A British economist born in the 19th century that became part of the Bloomsbury set. He started life as a mathematician, became a classical economist, and then suddenly changed his mind in the late 1920s, early 1930s, having seen the effects of the Great Depression spreading out of America across Europe. He had famously said once, when the facts change, sir, I change my mind. What do you do? In response, he wrote his magnum opus, Keynes, the general theory of employment, interest and money, just generally known as the general theory. And it really, it marked the starting gun for modern macroeconomics. It drew a distinction between the classical economics of the past that looked at self-correcting economies that would come back to full employment and actually articulated ways in which economies as a whole could go for prolonged periods of time with mass unemployment. Let's not forget that at the time there were towns in Britain where there were 70% unemployment, which led to the famous Jarrow March. So it was after the Second World War that macroeconomics essentially was Keynesian economics, and that continued until the mid-1970s, and some of the assumptions and prescriptions that he had put forward started to break down. It would be fair to say that Keynesian economics um, was pro-government intervention, but it wouldn't be fair to say it was anti-market. When Keynes looked at the economy, he saw an imperfect system, a system that could get stuck in sub-optimal positions in positions that incurred great human costs through long-term persistent unemployment. Keynes embraced instability and uncertainty in his analysis and sought to provide solutions, solutions that governments could embrace and be implemented by civil servants from the centre. But the fight back against active involvement in the economy started quickly. On the 10th of April 1947, an Austrian-born British economist called Frederick Hayek organised a conference of 39 economists and scholars. It was based in a small hotel in the village of Montperrin in Switzerland. And from that meeting, they formed a society that would have a profound influence on macroeconomic policy in the second half of the 20th century. It is a society that continues to meet to this day. Hayek's aim in that first conference was to bring together intellectuals from across the globe to try and resist the rise of state interventionism and the ascendancy of state planning and Keynesianism. He introduced a number of economists to each other, but key would be Milton Friedman, who along with Hayek would become one of the most influential economists of the second half of the 20th century. Hayek and Friedman and their fellow economists were united in their desire to take macroeconomics back to its roots roots in free markets and enterprise to refocus the balance of macroeconomic policy away from government spending to do more with the management of the money in the economy. But it took almost 30 years for their chance to come. It was by the late 1970s that the Keynesian consensus was starting to break down in the face of things such as high unemployment and high inflation, which hadn't been explained by Keynes. People were on the lookout for new answers. In the 30 years since 1947, many had written books, but Friedman and Hayek particularly had took the battle of ideas to the general public through their books such as Hayek's Road to Serfdom and Friedman's Capitalism and Freedom. These were taken up enthusiastically by politicians such as Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, 
and help form the basis of the consensus for macroeconomic policy coming over the next 30 years from 1979. If by the end of the 1970s, Keynesian economics was on its knees, it was the likes of Friedman and Hayek that delivered the death blow and established the new consensus. On the 14th of September 2008, queues started forming outside Britain's fourth biggest bank up and down the country. Northern Rock had been warned the day before that it may not have the resources it needed to meet demands for savers withdrawing their funds. Savers, having got wind of this, started to queue. What happened then was the first run on a bank in the UK for over 150 years. So this day, the 14th of September 2008, we didn't know it at the time, but it marks the end of the exuberant free market, freewheeling capitalism of Friedman and Hayek and the emergence of a new period. On the 15th of September the following day, the international investment firm Lehman Brothers filed for bankruptcy in the US. By the end of the month, global financial markets were in turmoil. Governments just didn't know what to do. And what happened next? over the following 12 months, very much sets the agenda for the world we live in today. It repositioned macroeconomics into the important third stage. The crisis that emerged in 2008 and going through into 2009 has rightly been compared to the Great Depression of the late 1920s and early 1930s. But the key distinction here is that policymakers had learned from the mistakes of the past and when they reached back to the past, they found that not only did they need to rely on the thoughts of Friedman, but they also needed to rediscover Keynes. Initially, in the October of 2008, the main concern was banks collapsing, particularly in economies that had large financial sectors like the UK and the US. The Bank of England and the US Federal Reserve literally started pumping billions and trillions of dollars into the system to make sure that there was suitable cash available. After all, Friedman, in one of his earliest texts, had identified the problem with the Great Depression, was that the US Federal Reserve had restricted the issuance of money. This time, they weren't going to make the same mistake. But what was really interesting was that they soon realised that this was not enough. A more wider government stimulus was needed. On the 2nd of April 2009, Almost six months after the depth of the crisis, Gordon Brown held a meeting of the G20, the largest 20 economies in the world, in London, and he announced an additional package of $1.1 trillion to bring the total package to $5 trillion. Now, this package was very clear. It was government spending. Keynesian was back on the agenda. So surprised were many commentators by this sudden re-embracing of Keynesian thought that it prompted the official biographer of John Maynard Keynes, Robert Skidelsky, to publish a book in September 2009 simply entitled Keynes, The Return of the Master, where he detailed all the fiscal stimulus packages and all the inspirations for the rescue packages that actually came from Keynesian thought. So if 2008 and 2009 marked a watershed in macroeconomic policy and thinking, where are we now, 10 years later? What is the framework of macroeconomic policy thinking? Well, to a certain extent, the way we approach problems now are a combination of both Friedman-like and Keynesian-like approaches. But there is a gap, a gap, funnily enough, that was identified by perhaps the most unlikely person possible. It was on the 5th of November 2008, perhaps at the very depth of the crisis, that the Queen visited the London School of Economics. Not known as an economic expert, she simply asked, it's awful, why did nobody see it coming? Nobody had an answer, and this led to much soul searching on behalf of professional economists who then decided to meet and work out why nobody saw it coming. Their letter, back to the Queen, dated the 22nd of July 2009, makes it very clear. So in summary, Your Majesty, the failure to foresee the timing, extent and severity of the crisis and to head it off, 
while it had many causes, was principally a failure of the collective imagination of many bright people, both in this country and internationally, to understand the risks to the system as a whole. This indeed is damning stuff. For professional economists to admit that they had a failure of the collective imagination and they didn't understand the risks of the system opens up a gaping hole within macroeconomics that stands wide open to this day. For sure we have learned things from the past from thinkers such as Friedman and Keynes and many others but what we need to remember is that this is a social science and some rules that seem hard and fast may wither on the vine as our behaviour changes. There is perhaps now a gap for a new Friedman or a new Keynes. We will have to wait and see, but that is the future of macroeconomics.